Dr. Walker, uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we are very excited to talk to you about artificial intelligence, automation, and the evolution of technology in healthcare. Great. Look forward to doing it. So, so you've had a distinguished career as a clinical leader, a quality expert, and an author, having published over 250 articles in a New York Times bestseller called The Digital Doctor. You're also considered the father of the hospital as specialty, the fastest growing specialty in the history of modern medicine. Tell us a bit about your background and specifically how you became interested in digital health. Well, uh, thank you, and I'm glad my mother's uh, bio of me uh, got to you so you were able to, to read that. It's, <laughs> it's a little embarrassing, but uh, <clears throat> I was a political science major in college. I, I was interested in how systems work. I also decided I wanted to be a doctor, so had to kind of combine those two parts of my brain. And uh, I think my career has been almost defined that way. I've, I've been lucky enough to have a number of leadership roles, and now my day job is to run the Department of Medicine at UCSF, so a big department with about a 1,000 physicians. Um, but I've always been interested in how the system is organized how people relate to each other, how information moves around, how the incentives influence what we do. And my North Star has always been what we now call value. That wasn't a, a word we used when I was in training, but you know how, uh, well, I'll tell you a quick story. I was talking to the medical students at UCSF a while back, and I said, you folks are gonna be into the, you know, entering this world where you're gonna be under immense pressure to figure out how to deliver <clears throat> how to deliver the highest quality, safest, most satisfying care at the lowest cost. I was trying to shake them up. And one student raised his hand and he said, what were you trying to do? And so I was always amazed by that, 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 that up until very recently, the incentives, the culture wasn't one in which we were being pressured to figure out how to deliver the best product at the lowest cost. That always seemed to me to be what should be our North Star. So that that led me to think about how do you organize hospital care, and that's where the hospitalist thing came from. It led me to get very involved in the quality and safety movements. And about six or seven years ago, it became clear to me that digital was going to be decisive, that ultimately, if we were going to figure out how to deliver the best care, the safest care at the lowest cost, digital was going to have to be a part of that. Healthcare was about the last major industry to become digital, and I was really enthusiastic about it because I thought it was the answer because I love my iPhone. I just felt like, you know, it, it, it makes most of the things we do better and, and more efficient and in some ways more fun. Uh, so I was kind of looking forward to healthcare's digital moment. And then we got digital over the last 10 years. And I was really surprised by how bumpy the road was. Uh, you know, when you ask doctors, uh, you know, are you burned out? Many of them say yes. And you ask them why. And they, they say their electronic health record was the reason number one. And that was not predictable, at least to me. And so I spent a year of my life trying to understand why the digital path was so bumpy in healthcare, uh, why we, it seemed to me we had not gotten it right and ended up writing a book about it. And I've spent the last five or six years really thinking hard about what the opportunities are in digital and why it's been so difficult and what the future path uh, is going to be. And, you know, I'm, I'm at a moment in my life where I actually am quite excited about the future of digital, but I, but I also recognize that it's not straightforward. It's not, you know, if you're, if you're Google, Apple, and you, your, your, your model is here's what we did in this industry, and we'll just go and do that in healthcare. Uh, no, it's not going to work out that way. Healthcare has a lot of things that are very different about it and make it much harder than uh, remodeling the way you do retail or the way you make restaurant reservations. Yeah, fascinating and, and, and makes a lot of sense. Um, you've published before on, on what you call the productivity paradox in digital healthcare. Can you talk a little more about what this productivity paradox is, how it came to be, and, and what steps you think we can take to overcome it? Yeah, the, the term was coined by uh, uh, Eric Brynjolfsson, who studies the, the transformation of industries. Uh, Eric was at MIT at the time. He's at Stanford now. And um, the, the, he coined it in 1993, I believe. So he certainly wasn't talking about healthcare because there was very little digital in healthcare at the time. He was talking about the experience of industries as they went from analog to digital. And whenever they did, there was an immense amount of, uh, amount of hype. 
uh, partly because you needed the hype or else people wouldn't have taken the plunge. It's too hard and too expensive. They just wouldn't have gone digital unless there was a lot of cheerleading, you know, and the cheerleading was, this is going to be great. It's going to get rid of our inefficiencies. It's going to make it whatever we produce um, better and, and cheaper and more productive. And then they would take the plunge and, and, and transform their work from analog to digital. And lo and behold, nothing would happen. And that was the paradox. The productivity paradox of IT, as Bernie described it in 93, was that when you looked at industry after industry that went from paper to digital, the paradox was the promised productivity benefits were not realized, uh, certainly were not realized right away. And one year would go by two, three, five sometimes, and you would not see the promised advantages uh, of digital. And people were left scratching their heads as to why, why, why weren't they seeing the benefits? And then if you waited long enough and the average wait was about 10 years, you began to see the benefits. And, and, and people studied that and asked like, okay, what is it that finally clicked in? And it turned out there were two things that, that seemed to click in, in somewhere around year 10. The first was the technology got better. And that's obviously clear from every industry. You know, version 1.0 isn't very good. And you get to version 29.7.b. <laughs> and finally, it's now really better. So there's sort of an iterative process of technology development that, that makes a difference. But the, the real epiphany, and I think the insight from that body of work was the second thing that happened was more important. And the second thing that, that happened was what Brynjolfsson and other call, others called reimagining the work. And reimagining the work meant that when industries went from paper to digital, they tended to replicate their paper processes. Mm -hmm. They tended to do exactly the way, the work exactly the way they'd done it before, except they now digitize it. Now, sometimes that was really, <laughs> that had some real advantages. It, it, it did make it a little bit better and a little bit faster, but they did not see the real benefits from digital until people came in and said, why are we doing it this way? And the answer was, because that's the only way we know how to do it. We've always done it this way. And they said, well, that makes no sense. If we thought about this in a brand new way in sort of a digital first way and thought about our work processes, then we could get you know, massive advantages from digital. And that was really the epiphany. And that's when you started to see the end of the productivity paradox, that's what was happening. You started be seeing people doing the work in very new ways that no one was creative enough to do in the beginning. And you started to see, uh, to see the benefits. So it's not that surprising to me that version 1.0 of, of healthcare digital, which was really electronic health records, did not lead to the productivity advantages that we hope for. Now, I, you know, there are people that periodically, you know, I, I hear people read my book and they come back and they say, yeah, you're right. Let's get rid of the computers and go back to paper. Now, those people are psychotic. <laughs> that, that's not the answer. And, and, and to be fair, in the first five to 10 years of digitization of healthcare, there have been advantages, I'd say, particularly on patient safety. Think about the number of errors that we used to see because someone couldn't read the doctor's prescription. Those are all gone. That's great. Uh, information moving from the hospital to the office or the office to the hospital or the hospital to Walgreens, that's all great. But in terms of productivity advantages, very little in part because we haven't changed the work processes very much. And what's exciting to me now is I think we actually are sort of leaving that first generation of a big enterprise electronic health record being the main way we have digitized to a new era where, where there's gonna be more different kinds of solutions, where we have a new generation of people coming in, including folks like you, who come in and don't know the old way we did things and look at some of the work processes and say, this makes no sense, why are we doing it this way? We need to come up with a new way of doing work. That's when we start seeing the real productivity uh, advantages. And I think we're beginning to see examples of that. I take you know, when I when I try to describe this to people, I often talk about the doctor's note. So I just finished, you know, my my few weeks on the wards at, at UCSF and I had to write my notes and my notes look like a piece of paper and they are found under a tab. And uh, and why does it look that way? Because that's what they looked like when they were in a three ring binder. And when in our case, Epic, but it could have been CERN or it could be any of the EHRs. 
thought about creating a physician's note, none of us were imagined enough to, to come up with anything other than, all right, it should look like a piece of paper and it's under a three ring binder. And is there any advantage to digital? Oh, sure. I can click a button and import in five pages of labs. So that actually makes it worse because now it's immensely cluttered. Uh, what would you think of if you were going to start fresh and say, what should the physician's note look like? You'd probably say, well, think about Google Docs. Think about Wikipedia. You know, it should be collaboratively created by multiple people. Think about a Twitter feed. It should have a, a way of communicating embedded in it. And, 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 and uh, it should have audio and it should have video and it should be rich and it should be easy to do data visualization. The current note has none of that. So, you know, and it's not surprising. It's we begin with what we know and it takes a generation or so to then begin reimagining the work. And I think the note is just one example of things that need to be to be reconceptualized with digital, <laughs> the digital capabilities and what we've learned about digital from other industries being kind of front and center as we think about what are we trying to do here in a physician note or in a patient interacting with a healthcare system or in how a patient schedules a visit or we how we provide decision support to a doctor or a nurse or to a patient. You sort of have to start with, all right, how would you do that today if we were inventing the thing today with digital being the underpinning as opposed to what we typically do, which is how did, have we done this for the last hundred years? And as we digitize that, how do we digitize that process, which never gets you to the place where you want to where you want to ultimately land? Yeah, I, I love that. This this idea that it's not just about taking something that is analog and, and making it digital, but actually reimagining the work and the system and the process that underpins that. Uh, that's great. You, you mentioned that you know it often takes 10 years for uh, an industry you know to reach that point where it's kind of surpassed or overcome the productivity paradox. Uh, so I'm curious, where do you think we are in healthcare today? Is it going to take healthcare longer than 10 years? Have we reached that post EHR era that you often talk about, uh, or do we still have a ways to go? I think we're starting it now. I, 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 where do I think we are? You know, in 2007, fewer than one in 10 American hospitals had an electronic health record. By 2017, fewer than one in 10 did not. So it was probably about 2011, 2012, when half of the hospitals and half of doctors' offices became electronic as their kind of fundamental way of capturing information and moving it around. So I, I kind of, that, I would call that the starting gun. Uh, so if you said that's right, we're almost 10 years into medicine as a digital industry. Clearly we have not solved our productivity paradox problem. So we're not gonna be at the 10 year Mark, and I think that was predictable. I think we're more of a 15 to 20 year time horizon kind of industry. Now, why is that? Uh, healthcare is harder for a hundred different reasons. We're a far more regulated environment, so the ability to experiment is limited. Uh, HIPAA makes it harder. Uh, privacy regulations and other different regulations make it harder. Um, the, I, the Silicon Valley mantra of fail fast sounds good when you're building a restaurant app and not so good if you have a dead patient and a malpractice suit and, and the ethical obligations we have to patients. So we've got to be really careful as we do things. Uh, medicine is a $4 trillion industry with a lot of entrenched entities that have an interest in the old way of doing things. Uh, my field and your field, medicine, you know, physicians are one of them. As I say to people, you know, it's a lot easier to uh, disrupt the work of taxi cab drivers than it is to disrupt the work of doctors. But whether it's doctors, academic health systems, health plans, uh, uh, you know, businesses, you know, all of the all of the entities now have, you know, to some extent, some of the inefficiencies in uh, are 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 a source of profitability for some of the entities. So there's a lot of things about it that just are harder than other industries. So. I think the first 10 years of healthcare digitization was mostly about getting electronic health records in, learning to use them, learning what they could do, and then learning, importantly, what they couldn't do. Um, and the era that we're now in, but not certainly finished with, I think actually just starting, is an era where people are recognizing the limitations of what electronic health record systems can do. And this isn't really a criticism of the companies. They were built to do what they 
were built to do. So they were good at collecting data and moving it around in pretty simple ways. They weren't really built to understand or use artificial intelligence. They weren't built around cloud computing. They weren't built to be patient facing. They were enterprise and clinician facing to a large extent or enterprise leadership facing, but not patient facing. They weren't built to do data visualization. There's sort of a ton of stuff they weren't built to do. So uh, thank goodness for them because they, they got us to a digital world, but now the next generation is how do we use all this data that's now sloshing around in our systems to deliver care that's better, safer, more accessible, more satisfying, less expensive. And I don't believe the electronic health record companies are going to, certainly they're not going to be the monolithic winners of that battle. They're going to be part of the system. They're not going to go away, but I think increasingly it's going to be a much more uh, pluralistic system where healthcare uh, delivery organizations are going to say, here's what my EHR can do and here's what it can't do. And I need to then think about how do I fill those gaps of what it can't do. Oh, sometimes it's going to be stuff that we build ourselves. Sometimes it's going to be stuff that we buy from third parties. Sometimes that's going to be startups. Sometimes it's going to be the digital giants that are now entering the field. I think it's going to be a really interesting and dynamic and much more complicated digital world than the first 10 years, which were basically buying a product, putting it in, and doing some innovations around the margins. I think the healthcare organizations that are going to see in the future are going to be ones that, that really kind of think hard about what are we trying to do here to improve healthcare value, and how do we do it? What can the EHR do? What can't the EHR do? And how do we fill those gaps? And you, you may have touched on this just now, but, but you've, you've sometimes talked about the four stages of health IT. Uh, do you mind talking a little more about what those stages are and what steps health systems can take to mature their health IT strategy, whether it's progressing across these four stages? Yeah, I, I came up with the concept when I was writing my book because as I kind of spoke to leaders in the digital world and the healthcare world and from other industries and, and thought about their path, it became obvious that, that there was a set of steps that industries took as they went, as they moved toward being a mature digital environment. And it was actually quite comforting because as I was trying to figure out why I and every doctor I knew was so grumpy about their electronic health record, I came to realize we're really early here. That's part of the challenge. You know, we have not, like, unlike business or retail or Wall Street, started digitizing in the late 80s and have had 25 years to mature this. We're really only five to 10 years into this. So the four steps it struck me where the first was you have to digitize the record, the way you collect uh, collect information and move it around your organization in fairly simple ways. The second is as a more global entity uh, or enterprise, you need to connect all of the parts. So, so in healthcare, that would be my Epic system connecting to your Cerner system or my inpatient record connecting to an outpatient record. Um, and in the early days, I really thought about that in terms of enterprise systems connecting to enterprise systems, uh, you know, Cerner to Epic kind of thing. But now I've come to realize that actually the more important question is, is that second step is not only do those pieces connect, but a third party tool, you know, a, a tool specifically built to improve the way we take care of patients with cancer or with diabetes or you name the problem. How easily does that connect in? with your enterprise system, because the enterprise core systems are not going to go away. And so, you know, do you have a plug and play environment? And, you know, everybody's analogy is the app store. Do you, do you have an app store environment where somebody can build something and it connects in a seamless way to your enterprise system? That's the second step. The third step is now you've got a ton of digital data floating around through all your digital tu tubes. Uh, are you taking advantage of that to make sense of your business in a new way, to understand the needs of patients, to understand the patterns, to predict things? Uh, and, the, and, and, and then the fourth, which, of course, is really where the money is, is are you taking those insights and building new ways of doing work that deliver on the promise of value? New ways of doing work may be new digital tools. It may be new ways of organizing the work. It may be changing the culture. It may be changing the incentive system. But it, it sort of is it's that final last mile where you're taking all of your insights and all the digital tools and digital capabilities and then delivering care that's better and safer and cheaper. And 
it was, you know, sort of that epiphany that led me to say, where are we? Well, we've now digitize the, the work, the, the, you know, all of our, very, there's not very much paper in my hospital anymore. It's the data is all being collected uh, digitally. Step two, do we have essentially interoperability? And the answer is partly, but not very much. You know, Epic to Epic is pretty good. Epic to CERN is not pretty good. Third party tools coming in to solve specific problems. It's still a lot of friction getting them to connect in with your enterprise system and make it work uh, seamlessly. And the fourth step, uh, the third step, are you analyzing it to to understand your business better? Not very much. We haven't really built the capabilities, taking advantage of, you know, how digital can help us do this. And the fourth, I think, you know, where we've at, like turned all of those insights into ways of delivering better and safer and cheaper care, very little. Um, part of my epiphany came from my older son who works in Major League Baseball doing Moneyball. And that's what he does for a living. And baseball, of course, has done this over 30 years and they have books and movies now we have about it. That's what he does. He, he takes they collect every piece of data that's possible. They analyze the, the hell out of it. And they then that's his job is deliver it back to the manager and the players in ways that improve their performance. And they are just, you know, they're they're many, many years ahead of where we are in healthcare. But I think at the end of the day, we will build the products and we will invest the money and change our workforce and workflow and culture in order to take advantage of it, just like uh, like baseball has done. Fantastic. Well, I'm hoping we have time for just one final quick question. Um, you've been a prominent and respected voice throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I'm curious, how have you seen the pandemic affect the willingness of health systems to engage in digital transformation efforts? And how long do you see that willingness uh, continuing to last? Well, clearly it pushed transformation uh, hard in areas that were mission critical, telemedicine being the most obvious example. I mean, it, it just became, became clear in the first five minutes that you needed to have a way of seeing your patients without seeing them in person. Patients didn't want to be seen in person and clinicians didn't want to be uh, be in the hospital if they didn't have to be. And so that was an example of a te technology that was ready for prime time. There were some regulatory and payment barriers that needed to fall and they did. And then you had, a, you know, it turns out existential fear is a really impressive driver of, of, of change. And so that happened really fast and we'll never go back down to 1% televisits. I think it's going to be an important part of the healthcare landscape to come. I think we also saw entities, uh, healthcare delivery organizations, recognize there were certain other things that they needed to do and build really quickly, um, and that digital was going to be the best way to do it. So, you know, at my place, we very rapidly needed to be able to send surveys to all of our clinicians every morning, asking them if they had symptoms and giving them a way to get a, have a pass to enter. Uh, clinics needed to reorganize themselves in terms of the way they registered patients and kept track of things, the way they did testing for COVID. So, you know, like all crises, all organizations have inertia. There's always resistance to change and crises are really good opportunities to be more nimble because you just, you know, you can cut through a lot of inertia and a lot of bureaucratic obstacles and, and at the federal and state level also some regulatory barriers fell. So I think it was it, it you know it was an exciting time for innovation, and I think some of the innovations that we saw during COVID will stick. Telemedicine being the most prominent, but I think also a recognition that for a lot of problems, if your traditional answer is we will throw more people FTEs at that. I think people began to recognize that's kind of silly and <laughs> there have to be ways to do some of these processes, particularly ones that create massive friction for patients, but also massive friction for frontline staff and for clinicians. There have to be ways of doing them, taking advantage of digital capabilities that ultimately deliver on the promise of better and safer and less expensive and more satisfying care. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how we come out of this, you know, organizations, um, tend to flip back toward their comfort zone. And so I think it'll be an organizational stress test. Do you take advantage of some of the things you learned during COVID and say, actually, we came up with a better way of doing it and let's keep doing that because it's better? Or do they kind of instinctively go back to quote normal, which I think will be a mistake. I think that, you know, I just have an abiding belief that organizations in healthcare that succeed in the future 
have to be ones that have figured out how to do digital really well and how to leverage it to make care better, safer, and cheaper. And, uh, and, and to the extent that they learned lessons about that during COVID, I, I hope they, they take this moment and say, you know, how are those lessons relevant to us going forward? Um, and some of those lessons are going to have to be, how do we leverage digital in order to, uh, to, to deliver, to do what we're trying to do and do it better than we did before. I'm, I'm actually quite excited about that. Fantastic. That's a great note to end on. Uh, well, Dr. Walker, thank you so much for your time. I uh, really appreciate it and really enjoyed the conversation. All right. Me too. Thanks for the opportunity. So I really enjoyed the conversation with Dr. Walker uh, just now on the four stages of health IT, the evolution of health IT for health systems, and some of the challenges health systems face with static data and uh, manual repetitive processes. What we'll talk about next in this portion is how we can extend the value of EHR data with intelligent automation and how intelligent automation and a digital workforce can help unlock the value of EHR data uh, in terms of many of the processes across the care continuum. Here we've shown the four stages of health IT that Dr. Walker often alludes to. The first stage is digitizing health records. And essentially, this is what EHRs have enabled for us. They've enabled an improved healthcare record quality, as well as a digitized record to support data-driven decision-making. At this stage, almost every health system has achieved this stage and, and reached a point where we have digitized health records. However, EHRs are not enough, which takes us to stage number two, which is connecting the parts where we now have different APIs, interfaces, and integration platforms, which allow us to not just digitize data, but actually get more comprehensive insights from that data and start to connect external applications with the healthcare data we have. We're now just seeing health systems enter into the third stage, which is how do we glean insights now that we've connected the parts? In this third stage, there's a heavy reliance on artificial intelligence, which is you know, a combination of techniques such as machine vision, machine learning, and natural language processing to help us identify new opportunities to improve healthcare outcomes using the data that we currently have. However, a key point that Dr. Walker has made and which we'll cover in this presentation is how artificial intelligence on its own is simply not enough. Once we have those insights, we need a way to act on them and to uh, take action in a way that's scalable and productive. Too often we see a over-reliance on hiring more staff and an over-reliance on manual repetitive processes to act on the intelligence that we've gathered in stage three. And that's why we're so ex excited about stage four, which is acting on these insights using robotic process automation, which is the technology of training software bots to interact with a computer screen and software application the same way a human being does. These bots can serve as an extension of the human workforce by allowing them to interact with the software application in both inputs and outputs and scale the capabilities of the human workforce by performing tasks on behalf of staff and clinicians. We'll get into much more of this in the coming slides. Now, when we talk about stage four, the core problem there is that despite all of the insights we have, we're unable to act on it without an agent like robotic process automation. On this slide, you'll see an example uh, case study from one of our partners who has an industry leading 90% MyChart activation. Yet despite 90% of patients being activated on MyChart, that particular system found that 85% of patients were still put in some type of admin administrative work queue. And we've listed what those work queues are on the right side of the screen. So you'll see despite the fact that we have a digital platform for patients, it still ends up that so much of our work in health systems today is manual and repetitive and human-based in nature. Everything from triage and scheduling to registering new patients, determining a guarantor, and working through work queues. And this is where Notable as an intelligent automation platform has really uh, shown tremendous value is in not just digitizing and building interfaces and connections, but actually providing a means to act on it uh, and extend the capabilities of the human workforce. At its core, Notable's intelligent, intelligent automation platform has four key components, which are listed here. 
The first is artificial intelligence, which is knowing what to do. This is how the bot knows what tasks to perform, how to read a document, how to ask for an insurance card, how to then take that insurance card and glean the most important insights from it. If AI is the what the, the bots do, RPA, the second component, is how the bots do it. So again, RPA is the technology of training bots to interact with a computer screen just like a human being does. And by doing so, the bots are able to perform workflows in an automated manner. Whether that workflow is teeing up a note for a provider, uh, pre-populating an order to close a care gap, or reaching out to a patient who's overdue for care. The third component is intuitive design. You know, we've found in healthcare that if we don't focus on design and we don't focus on patient satisfaction, then nothing else matters because patients simply don't use the technology. It's time in healthcare that we had a laser focus on design and on the user experience in order to drive downstream efficiencies. At Notable, we take these design challenges extremely seriously and invest a lot of effort in making sure that everything the patient touches and uses feels very delightful and very easy. And finally is custom configurability. As an automation platform, we have created a set of building blocks that can be conformed and combined to create a configurable solution to any manual or repetitive process uh, that currently exists within a health system today. When we talk about intelligent automation, we have enabled an entire library of flows where we refer to a flow as any human workflow or process that is currently performed today. We train our fleet of digital assistants or bots on performing these flows and each flow follows a three-step process of scan, perform, and update. The scan step is where the bot scans the EHR record to identify which patient population or group to perform an action on. In the perform step, the bot actually performs that action, whether that's closing a care gap, teeing up a note, you know, identifying an insurance plan, or reaching out to a patient. And in the update step, the bot then notifies the health system staff of the task that it has just performed. With this three-step process, we're able, to enable, we're able to enable hundreds of flows within the Notable platform. We've shown those flows in four big umbrella categories here. On the top left, you have the call center and CBO workflows. So having the bots help and extend human capacity in everything from triaging patients to the right provider at the right time, getting them scheduled, getting them activated onto a patient portal that may exist, all the way to more revenue cycle functions like insurance plan selection and guarantor determination. On the top right are the staff for workflows. So these are all of the tasks that your front desk and medical assistant staffs are, are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Things like calling patients for appointment reminders, collecting informed consents, and reviewing medications and allergies. Again, with intelligent automation, the bot can do all of these workflows before the visit in an automated manner and in a way that is truly delightful for patients to use and experience. On the bottom left is the care coordinator workflows. So this is the population health type workflows, everything from reaching out for open care gaps to scheduling patients for visits that they're due for to risk assessment and post-discharge follow-up. And on the bottom right is the clinician workflows. We know that clinician burnout uh, is a major problem in the industry today. And we also know clinicians are often overburdened with too much on their plate. Here, we're showing how bots can be used to help physicians improve their capacity by doing things like predicting orders, uh, assisting with documentation, and even assisting with things like medication reconciliation. In the center are the EMRs. We know that these electronic medical records are huge investments, they're important investments, and they're the systems of record. So Notable doesn't aim to displace or replace any of these. Instead, Notable is an intelligence layer and an automation layer that sits on top of your EMR and helps your staff get the most out of their work days by automating these workflows. We'll now move into a demo of how intelligent automation works in the Notable platform. And to showcase this uh, and to bring it to life, we'll, throw, we'll show three uh, unique demo instances or examples. And each example will highlight how intelligent automation and bots 
can get us to that fourth stage of health IT, where we don't just have insights, but we actually have the ability to act on them. The first example use case is streamlining call center workflows in Epic. We hear time and time again from many of our partners on Epic that despite having MyChart and, and a phenomenal EMR, there still exists large call centers and work queues of human beings who are performing these manual processes, whether that is you know, calling patients to confirm a guarantor or a secondary payer, or you know, looking through uh, complex decision trees to identify who the insurance plan should be based on the insurance card. Here, we're showing how Notable's digital assistants and bots can perform those same workflows in an automated manner. First, the bot will scan the EHR for any additional registration information that wasn't collected properly or still is required to be filled out. The bot will then reach out to the patient with a text message or email and prompt the patient to provide the information it needs to close those registration gaps. Notable's bots will then use intelligence and optical character recognition or OCR to automatically populate the insurance plan and plan ID based on an insurance card picture that a patient gives us. No different from a bank pulling out the checking information from a check that you take a picture of on your phone. And then finally, uh, Notable can help CBO workflows like collecting and populating guarantor information and validating that that information is correct before it gets placed into the EMR. On the right side of the screen, you're seeing RPA in action. So this is an example of how the bots do their work. You're seeing a bot open within the registration tab of a patient's chart in the electronic medical record. And the bot using RPA is actually clicking on drop downs, it's clicking on radio buttons, it's entering in text, it's uploading images. It's performing these workflows just like a human being would in its role. Uh, and we can set up these workflows in an extremely rapid manner and really across multiple software applications. So we can connect a, a RCM platform to a practice management software to an EHR and have the bots work seamlessly between all three. From here, we'll go to example number two, which is using automation to power patient intake and power form completion. We hear, especially with COVID, that patients simply do not want to fill out forms on a clipboard in clinic in a waiting room. Uh, and while digitizing these forms is step number one, having the intelligence to know which forms to deliver to which patient and how to translate those forms to automated histories and intakes for the provider is really quite crucial. So in step number one, you'll see the bot scanning the medical record, in this case, Cerner, to look for patients who are coming up in the clinic schedule and to identify which problems those patients have and which forms those patients need to be given. So for example, if the bot recognizes that a patient has COPD, it's going to know to send a COPD intake form along with the standard registration, check-in, consent forms to that particular patient. In step number two, the bot is performing the task of sending this intake to the patients and you're actually watching the patient, in this case, go through and fill out the form. You'll see there's many unique design uh, uh, features that we've put in here, everything from a search-like functionality when you're searching for your pharmacy to dynamic questions where how you answer one question will affect the next question that appears to white labeling the entire experience where the primary and secondary colors as well as the logo reflect the health system that we're working for. You're also seeing that with a simple web-based platform, patients are able to do everything from register for their appointment, to reconcile their medications, to even pay their copay, all from the same platform. You're also seeing that this is web-based. It's not hosted in a separate application. And because it is web-based, we're able to deliver it in a very seamless manner, and we're seeing patient engagement and completion rates upwards of 80%. Finally is the update step, where once the bot has obtained all this information from the patient, it's going to use RPA once again to enter it into the right discrete and unstructured data fields within the EMR. You're actually seeing the bot just there start and write a note for the provider in appended state, where the bot is taking all of the information the patient gave us in the multiple choice intakes and using natural language processing is converting those multiple choice answers 
into a paragraph style history of present illness for the provider, which you're seeing right there. We're seeing providers save between 45 and 60 minutes a day from having this automated note content, allowing clinicians and staff to focus on higher level tasks and more time consuming processes. The final example we'll show is for pre-visit planning and population health where bots can help manage large populations of patients and close care gaps in an efficient manner. You're seeing on the right the bot do this work once again with RPA, where the bot can actually go into the record, scan a patient's chart to identify which care gaps that patient has. So for example, if the patient is a diabetic, the bot can look through to see when the last hemoglobin A1C was done. If it finds that the A1C has been more than six months, it knows to reach out to that patient to invite them in for a visit or a laboratory test. We can do the same type of outreach campaign for any care gap, whether that's a Medicare visit, an overdue colonoscopy, or a screening mammogram. And in this way, we're able to drive an enormous number of patients who've been forgotten or left out of the healthcare system back into care. Once the bot has engaged with these patients who have open care gaps, the bot can also use artificial intelligence to predict which orders the physician needs at the point of care to close those care gaps. As a clinician myself, if I'm about to see a patient who has three care gaps, the bot would have already populated three orders, for example, an A1C or a referral to an ophthalmologist to close those care gaps for me. Whereas a clinician, all I have to do is sign the order or edit the order as opposed to going through all of the clicks on my own to close the care gap. So in this way, we find that the bots have been this incredible force of nudging providers toward best practices and also offloading providers during their already very busy days. Hopefully these three example use cases from the call center and work queue automation, the pre-visit digital patient intake automation, as well as the pre-visit planning and population health, show you just three of many, many examples of how intelligent automation can be used to get health systems to that fourth stage of health IT, the ability to actually act on the insights that we generate from artificial intelligence and digitized records. Here we're showing how the entire experience looks end to end uh, in, in two different instances. On the top, you're seeing what we often see from health systems when there are a number of point solutions that are tried, that, that, that have been attempted to be stitched together. When that occurs, you'll see that the experience ends up being very disjointed for providers, patients, and staff. So for example, in the top side, you'll see that although many point solutions exist, there are still these manual stop signs uh, where human staff are having to step in and assist the process to help get it to completion. So for example, you may have a way to reach out to patients for upcoming visits, but maybe only 20% of patients actually use the digital check-in mechanism, meaning for the other 80% of patients, you still have to have a call center and a work queue to reach out to those patients and get them registered in the right way. You may still have to call patients to confirm insurance and perform an eligibility check or send manual letters to patients to collect copays and outstanding balances, and your physicians are still manually writing out notes and orders in a very uh, cumbersome and tedious process. On the bottom, you're seeing what this care continuum looks like when it's been automated with Notable's intelligent automation platform, where end to end you have bots assisting with everything from reaching out to patients, engaging nearly 100% of those patients, to performing automated eligibility, insurance plan selection, copay collection, digital intake, and patient form completion, all the way to the clinical arena of automating note content and orders on behalf of providers. We'll end here with uh, a slide showing uh, some of our current advisors and partners that we're very fortunate to work with. As Dr. Walker, one of our advisors listed on the left often says, there are these four stages of health IT. Fortunately, fortunately EHRs have unlocked that first stage of digitizing records as an industry, we're progressing through stages two and three of having interfaces and connections and artificial intelligence to glean insights. But we're really excited about that fourth stage and using automation and intelligent automation to help unlock and automate so many of these manual processes within the health system. We're fortunate to be partnered with three of the top 15 health systems in the United States by size, 
as well as many other systems and community health centers across the country. And we're also very proud of the impact that we've had on an enterprise, uh, on an enterprise scale, as you see on the right, with tens of thousands of automations performed by our bots each day, deployed in over 350 sites, and perhaps most importantly, with a 97% patient satisfaction and a 74 net promoter score for providers. Thank you again to Dr. Walker uh, for the time earlier today in the interview, uh, and we're excited to open it up to questions as we chat more about how intelligent automation can help unlock and progress us in the uh, journey towards health IT innovation. Thank you. All right, thank you so much everybody for attending. My name is Matt Turner, I lead marketing for Notable. And I'm here with Dr. Mithu Alagapan for a, a live Q&A. Uh, unfortunately, Dr. Walker had to head off to record a podcast. But there are a lot of questions for, for Dr. Alagapan, so I will just get right into it. Dr. Alagapan, is Keith Kifringer still on the line with us? I am, thank you, Matt. All right, fantastic, let's get into it. So number of questions around, so first let's start with some questions about the Notable platform because we got a lot of good ones. There was a number of questions around accessibility and how Notable thinks about using AI and automation to understand how to engage differently with patients based on either language requirements or accessibility requirements. How does the platform you know, provide access and, and the ability to folks who either speak different languages or uh, or have vision or other challenges? Yeah, this is a terrific set of questions. And at Notable, we really uh, obsess over the design of the platform and the user experience. You know, there's, there's probably two ways to look at this. One is as a checkbox, you know, do you or do you not have a, you know, digitized patient intake? But the second way to look at it that we prefer is not just do we have it, but how many patients actually use it? And that's one of our North Star metrics is, how many patients are completing these intakes digitally before or after appointments? And we've consistently been over 70% uh, on that metric. Now, the reason for that is we take a design lens to answering the question of how do you create the best possible experience for patients and make it so that every patient is able to access and use the platform in the same way. So I'll give you a number of examples for how we do that. So one, we're supported, uh, in, we support multiple languages where the patient can simply toggle uh, on the Notable platform to any language that they want and instantly all of the forms are converted to their native language. So we support Portuguese, Spanish, even Khmer. Uh, so with that type of multiple language support, we see a number of patients who may have previously been marginalized or excluded from English-only forms are now able to participate and many times even give us feedback in that native language. Uh, another example of supporting patients with vision impairment. So we have designed the platform so that you can use voiceover assistive technology on an iPhone or Android device to complete the form. Uh, and we've had a number of blind patients actually complete the form totally on their own using voiceover assistance uh, on their mobile devices. So that's just two of a number of examples that we've enabled uh, and built into the platform to make sure that we've got, we're actually democratizing uh, the, the access to patient forms, patient intake, and, and overall the patient experience. Fantastic. Uh, another set of questions around EHR compatibility. Uh, there are a number of folks asking, you know, there's a slide with a list of some of the EHRs that we'll work with. Can you help clarify, you know, you know, does Notable work with all EHRs or just the ones that were listed on the slide? It, it works with all EHRs, even ones not listed on the slides, uh, and also other non-EHR software applications. So the bots can be logged into a CRM or a practice management software along with multiple EHRs at the same time remotely. One thing we realized early on in our journey uh, is that 
integration is where so much of healthcare, healthcare innovation goes to die. Uh, so what we've done with RPA is we've enabled an integration that's lightweight and flexible and can be done uh, relatively quickly in any EHR instance. So our bots are logging in remotely to your EHR just like a remote employee would. And in that way, we don't depend on APIs or Fire to gain access. Uh, the bots can gain access to the graphical user interface the same way a human employee would. And, and using a virtual uh, keyboard and virtual mouse can perform the same actions as your staff do. Uh, and so in that way, we've supported all types of EHRs, including ones not listed on the screen. Got it. Somewhat related question. There was a really interesting question around the idea of using structured versus unstructured data. Uh, there, there are pros and cons to, to both sides around how you can make utility of the data using unstructured data. Uh, there's also a lot of value there as well. You know, how do you think about you know, getting the value out of both you know, structured data while you can while also taking advantage of unstructured data based on the, the type of automation or patient interaction or clinical scenario? Sure. Uh, you know, many modern uh, health IT applications are limited by their ability to only work with structured data. One of the, uh, I think, real powers of the Notable platform is that we both work with structured and unstructured data as both inputs and outputs. Let me give an example. We can take an unstructured data input. For example, we can take a, a fax that has been scanned in. Uh, or a you know handwritten prescription, um, or a you know history and physical provider note. So all examples of unstructured data, and then we can apply natural language processing and optical character recognition to convert that into structured data that, that we that, that we can then manipulate and work with. But we don't just do that with inputs. We can actually also output to both structured and unstructured data. So if a patient fills out one of our clinical questionnaires we can take their answers, keep it as structured data, and enter that data into discrete data fields in the EMR. For example, if a patient tells us they want a refill or that they're no longer taking a particular medication, we can export those, uh, those, those answers as discrete data if the EHR supports it. But the power comes where we cannot just, you know, we're not limited to just structured data. We can also export that as unstructured data. We use proprietary natural language processing algorithms to convert patient multiple choice answers into narrative uh, text notes for the provider uh, that, that is present in their chart as a pendant note. And we're seeing providers save 45 to 60 minutes a day because some you know, parts of their note have been automated using our NLP software, uh, taking structured data and converting it to unstructured. So, so just to summarize there, I think really one of the powers of the Notable platform is that we can both work with inputs that are structured or unstructured, and then also output that data in both structured and unstructured ways. Got it. Makes tons of sense. There's some questions around uh, how a bit, a bit more detail around how patient engagement works, and specifically around you know. How, how, do, how are patients involved in audit, automation of, of staff workflows? And, and I think there's a broader question of help us understand the intersection between you know, things that are automated versus you know, interactions that are, are not automated, like the patient completing the form, and how those, how those play off of each other as part of a broader workflow. Yeah, so, so at our core, we are an automation platform, an intelligent automation platform for healthcare, for healthcare where we are combining a number of AI capabilities like machine vision, OCR, NLP with automation. So as an intelligent automation platform, our aim is to be able to automate uh, any manual workflow in healthcare, whether that manual workflow is performed currently by a physician or a staff member or a billing analyst, uh, it doesn't matter. However, if we look at the scope of manual processes that healthcare workers perform, Many of them involve needing to communicate with a patient, right? So you need to call a patient to reschedule an appointment or interact with a patient to collect a copayment or to fill out a form. So any intelligent automation platform for healthcare must have a delightful way to digitize that patient interaction that is currently performed by humans today. So our patient interfaces are exactly that. They are a, a digital means of interacting with patients, of getting information to and from patients 
in a way that allows human staff to focus on other tasks. So we use that interface in a number of ways. So our patient-facing web application is used by patients to register as new patients at a health system, to check in for appointments, to pay an outstanding balance or a copay, to reconcile an allergy list or a medication list or answer clinical questions or sign a consent form. It's even used after a discharge to you know, answer questions about how the patient's feeling after leaving the hospital or to fill out a patient reported outcome. So all of that falls within the bucket of how do we automate processes for staff uh, when some of those processes require us to be able to interact with patients. And that's why we've really invested in a delightful uh, um, patient web application that patients love using. Uh, and you know, I think you'll see on the screen that 97% patient satisfaction rating speaks to that. And that's where we've supported the multiple languages, the voiceover technology, and really democratized that digital experience. Got it. That makes tons of sense. I'm going to switch tack a bit to uh, a set of questions that I found personally very interesting around uh, around getting the most out of AI, but also you know addressing some of the the challenges that AI has has been labeled with in in the media at least. The, the first is you know help us understand with with the notable platform, you know, what type of, of oversight or checking is involved in the process of of an AI-enabled digital assistant or bot going in into the EHR. So how do organizations who use this type of technology understand so what the bot is doing, how it's been done, and why? Yeah, that's a good question. So, so uh, much of our uh, automations are deterministic in nature rather than probabilistic. I saw there was a question about that. And what I mean by that is that our automations are configured around what we call scenarios, where we are deterministically telling a bot, if this happens, then do this. So for example, if a patient has a copay of greater than $30, then you know, send the patient an intake where they can pay digitally. Or if the patient is a diabetic, then send them this diabetic questionnaire. So because those rules are deterministic, we have full control over how we configure those, and of course our health system partners uh, can, you know, we can configure them in a way that matches the current workflows that our partners support. Now, where we use AI the most is in uh, allowing the bots to have a greater level of intelligence or understanding to perform their tasks. So, for example, we'll use AI to convert a fax or a scanned document into editable text that we can then use to export data to a clinical registry or to surface key insights for a provider. Again, we may use AI to take, uh, you know, if a patient takes a picture of their insurance card, we'll use OCR to convert that insurance card into a set of structured data that we can then use to automatically predict what health plan or health product, uh, health plan product that patient has. So the probabilistic AI comes mostly from, uh, uh, you know, doing things like converting documents, predicting a health plan, uh, translating patient answers into a provider note uh, that's pending for them. Uh, but um, many of our, you know, clinical orders and clinician-facing automations are deterministic in nature, which is where it's no longer a black box. We actually have full control over what those scenarios and rules look like. Got it. I think we have time for one last question. Uh, well, what would you say are the typical time and internal resources required to, to implement this type of solution? It, it's a great question, and it's it's somewhere that, you know, this question is very core to how the platform is designed, in which we want to make the platform as straightforward and rapid to deploy as possible, and I think we've enabled that. So typically, we're able to deploy the platform in under two weeks in many cases, and certainly under four weeks. Now, I know that sounds incredible, and the reason is because we use RPA, which allows us to go live as soon as our bots have login credentials uh, so, they can, so that they can log in remotely to your EMR or software applications. Uh, so in that way, we have a very minimal lift on internal IT teams uh, or internal security teams because we're not waiting in a long queue or backlog to build APIs and, and different interfaces to connect with the EHR. We're able to use the graphical user interface and go live quite quickly. So, uh, so we see go live times that are extremely rapid. 
Of course, we partner uh, significantly with our health systems on iteration, not integration. So when we're looking at new workflows, when we're talking about change management around how do we configure this to match the processes you already have in place, you know, we work very closely with our dedicated customer success team and our health system partners. But we, we like to spend as little time as possible in IT and in integration so that we can spend most of our effort on iteration and creating the best outcomes possible. I think that makes tons of sense. Dr. Alec Appen, thank you so much for, for joining us today. I know we we're in time. And thank you so much to everybody who joined us today. Apologies we couldn't get to all of the great questions folks had. We had almost 30 come in, and we only had around 15 minutes to get to all of them. But if there's any other questions, uh, Dr. Alec Appen or the notable team be uh, happy to try and address those via email. Uh, thank you again, everybody, for joining us, and have a fantastic week. Thank you all.